Hey, it's Dr. Fanistel. I want to talk today about some of the actual mechanics of how pain is transmitted. Uh, so this is sort of a neuroscience lesson, a neuroanatomy lesson even. It can really help to just reinforce that there's a science behind this and maybe to understand what's happening on a little more granular level than it often gets talked about. And I want to mention up front two basic understandings I have about the people I'm talking to. One, you've done your due diligence. I'm a fan of due diligence. I don't want to take mind-body medicine and try to use it to treat something potentially dangerous that Western medicine has a cure or a really good treatment for. So do that, absolutely. Most of the people I see have done their due diligence in spades, um, but that part is important. And then the second really key thing to understand here is that when I talk about pain coming from the brain, I'm talking about the part of the brain that you don't have direct control over. And it's important to understand that most of your brain is devoted to getting you through the world safely. That's the most important thing the brain does. In fact, you can't do anything else without that happening first. With that understanding of who I'm talking to here, let's look at how pain works on a structural level. Out in our body, we have a bunch of sensors, nerve endings. Some of them sense things that could be potentially dangerous. And these are called nociceptors. These are nerve endings that respond to potentially dangerous stimuli coming in. And several different types of nociceptors have been identified. We have nociceptors that respond to heat changes. We have nociceptors that respond to mechanical changes like pressure. We have nociceptors that respond to chemical changes like too much acid. Some of these nociceptors respond to all of these different things. Others, called silent nociceptors, only send a signal to the brain when the cell has actually been damaged. The other ones will often fire under the threat of tissue damage. So anyway, these are nerve endings out in our periphery, all over our body, inside us, outside us. And these nerve endings out in the body transmit this message of potential danger to the spinal cord. Uh, and here's a little diagram of how it comes in. In the lower left, we've got a nerve called the nociceptor that sends a signal in to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord via this thing that's this red line there. They're calling the afferent nerve fiber. And these names aren't that important. But the point is that this potentially dangerous input comes into the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. And then it crosses over to the other side of the spinal cord and goes up the spine along the spinothalamic tract to the thalamus. Spine, thalamus, spinothalamic tract. And the thalamus is often referred to as the relay station of the brain. The thalamus goes, let's see, that sensory input came from the left ankle. Let me send that to the left ankle part of the brain. And it does so, and then I realize, oh, I've got something going on in the left ankle. That is how we have been treating pain and looking at pain for a long, long time. That's not what pain is. What I just described is called nociception, the incoming potentially dangerous sensory input. Pain is a different animal. In this drawing, we can see the red lines coming in from the bottom. This is on the lower right, pain is coming in on the bottom, or sensory input is coming in from a nociceptor that crosses over to the other side and goes up the spinothalamic tract to the brain. That's all the red stuff. And then the brain processes that information and sends messages instantaneously back down. And this is represented in this diagram by the green fibers. These nerve fibers go back down the spinal cord from the brain and they connect to the upcoming fibers at the midbrain. And they connect to the upcoming fibers at the medulla. These are both structures in the base of my brain here. And these downgoing nerve signals, represented by green, connect to the upcoming nerve signals, represented by red, even right there at the very bottom of the spinal cord, right where the sensory input came in, right in that dorsal horn, telling these upcoming fibers, hey, you can calm down, it was a false alarm, or boy, fire harder, we're in trouble. So this is often referred to as the descending pain modulatory system. The brain modulates pain. And here's just another little diagram. Signals go up, and then the thalamus relays them, the brain does stuff, and then the brain modulates these signals going back down. So the old-fashioned view of pain is represented by this picture in the upper left that Descartes drew in, uh, actually it was the 17th century. Um, and he says, because uh, the reason we have pain when my foot's in a fire is because I have a brain. He's not wrong about that, but he only had half the picture. The new understanding is that yes, when my foot's in a fire, signal goes up and then the brain does a whole bunch of stuff based on prior experience. 
mood, attention. Maybe there's some genetic input, who knows, but based on a lot of stuff, the brain decides stuff and sends a signal back down that tells these other nerves how hard to keep firing. So pain involves memory, emotions, expectations, and that includes cultural expectations. What are you hearing from the world around you? Mood and your attention. What are you paying attention to? All of this plays into pain. Pain is a two-way street, not just sensory input coming in. So can you see how, based on actually how the nervous system and the brain and the spinal cord are put together, how pain isn't just what's coming in? There's actually some neuroscience and some neuroanatomy behind this idea that your brain is controlling your pain. This isn't just some woo-woo idea. This is how we are constructed. And once you know that, then it makes sense to say, hmm, do I want to try to treat my pain, or at least some of my pain, by focusing on my brain instead of focusing on this body tissue problem that I've been focusing on for so long and nobody seems to make it get better. I did Western medicine for 30 years. It cures a lot of things. But if that's not working, then it makes sense to say, all right, I've done the due diligence to make sure I'm not dying here or that I don't have cancer, whatever. Now let me turn my attention to the brain and see if I can help my brain modulate my pain differently. It works all the time, and it even works in people who have real structural problems. If you have a real structural problem that's easily fixable, go get it fixed. But so many of these things, they're not easily fixable. Can we train the brain to calm down and go, oh, okay, I'm getting older, or I did have an accident, and I can't move my shoulder the way I always could. It's going to hurt when it gets to a certain point. That's your brain warning you. Don't take it past that point. That's fine. But this is where pain reprocessing therapy and neuroplastic retraining tools, including emotional awareness and expression therapy, expressive writing, guided imagery exercises, can really help with chronic pain. Whether you have nothing wrong or whether you just have something that nobody can fix, mind-body tools really help over and over again. And there's a scientific basis for this. There's an understanding that there is a different way to approach your pain, and it's a legit way even to approach structural issues as long as those structural issues don't have a better fix from out there in the world. And I talked about the cultural messaging here. There's a lot of cultural messaging around certain structural issues. Long COVID, holy crap, that's a scary thing. There's a lot of cultural messaging around back pain. There's a hundred million dollar back, or wait a minute, billion dollar back pain industry out there that would have you believe that, hey, if we keep looking here, if that works for you, a shot or a surgery, I'm for it. And there are certain times where surgeries and shots are okay, but chronic long-term back pain, mm, these things like shots and procedures work about the same as placebo. So you do you. I'm just asking you to open your mind up, and I hope I'm giving you a little more information about exactly how the nervous system is put together that allows you to kind of go, hmm, maybe I will work on that aspect of it. Because people who dive into this and start taking agency over their nervous system start getting better. I'm Dr. Brad Fanastill. You can find me at bouldermindbodymedicine.com. Have a great rest of your day.